Alpha. Hi everyone. So we were supposed to be on the live stage at the photography show introducing you to food stories, the inside scoop, but instead we are in our home kitchen filming this to share some tips and tricks about how to get started in food photography and filming. Now I'm Kate Kirkman and my husband is Brent. We work for a number, we run a number of businesses, one of which is Photography Film and Air by Lumiere and our food work falls under that. And we also run Kate Hope Will Smith business, which is weddings and boudoir and that kind of thing. I'm this side of the camera today and Brent's actually behind filming. So we do work together and we both do photography and we both do filming. So in this, if you like, half an hour, we're going to try and talk about both. It will only be a brief overview because it's a big subject. And back in January, we filmed a 10 by 10 masterclass for a new foodie channel called Planet Eat. And on that, we were able to dig much more into the, the, the lighting elements, composition, colour theory. We're just not going to be able to cover all of that in half an hour. So if you are interested and this gives you a, a taste, if you like, then I suggest you go and sign up and watch the extended masterclass. So food content has become incredibly and increasingly popular over the last few years and that's a lot to do with the rise in food blogging and social media such as Instagram. When you can't touch and taste and smell food, our job is to still make it look good enough to eat. So we're just going to go through a few hints and tips to get you all started. So we're going to focus on just three areas. The kit we use, certain techniques that help, and we're going to touch on styling. So first of all, we're going to talk about kit. So it's important to say that in terms of kit, you don't have to have loads to start with food photography. And I don't want anybody to be concerned when you see what we use and the way we use it. You can absolutely begin with a, a small, say mirrorless camera, one lens, and learn to use natural light. So I don't want anybody to get caught up on the kit or the lighting. Think more about how you can translate this into the environment that you might work in. So fundamentally, we are Sony. Uh, Brent and I are both Sony imaging ambassadors. So obviously we shoot with that system, which we absolutely love. And it's mirrorless. And mirrorless is fantastic because it's small and lightweight. And also you can see what you get. And that really, really helps in terms of food photography and working quickly. So Brent and I also shoot people a lot and we do other bits of commercial work and we tend to use different cameras for different aspects of, of our work. For food, we both have a preference for the A7R4 and that's because it shoots both photography and film in a, in a fantastic way and the resolution of these cameras means that we can actually zoom in both in the photography element and the stills element. Okay, so in terms of lenses, let's have a look at what we've got here. I don't want anybody to panic when you see so many of them lined up because we do shoot a lot of other things. We do have a lot of lenses. However, the one lens that I think is absolutely essential for food photography is actually the smallest and the most inexpensive, which is a 50 millimeter f2.8. And this one is also macro, which is really good for getting some really close up. Uh, shots of food. However, we also like to use our uh, um, 85 f 1.8. The 135 is just beautiful for really tight in shots. But again, I would never suggest you buy something like this unless you're going to use it in lots of other areas of photography. And then our workhorse lens is a 2470, which Brent will be largely filming on today. So this is also um, fantastically useful. Now, when you are actually shooting food commercially, it becomes very important to be able to control your lighting. So whilst I'm a huge lover of natural light, it is difficult in this country, if you're shooting throughout the year, to be able to control it and to be able to have it when you need it. Because in the winter, as we all know, the lights you know, go down as such at around half past three, four o'clock. So if you're shooting commercially, that can be a real problem. So we have already invested in a, a lighting system and you can see um, that we use Profoto. And Profoto is fantastic for us because it is dual purpose in the sense that it is strobe, so flash, but also continuous light, which is what Brent's using at the moment, that is dimmable and also temperature controlled so we can actually change the colour from daylight through to much warmer tones. 
they're cool running and you can modify them. So really often we are just trying to recreate big window light but we're able to keep it completely constant and consistent and that's really important for us. Also when we talk about shutter speeds I'm going to explain the benefits of using flash over natural light. So in terms of filming this we're actually using 2B10s in continuous mode and they're also in terms of flash 250 watts which is pretty powerful it's four to five speed lights but you notice I've got a little speed light here which is the Profoto A1Xs and a lot of people begin food photography with one really straightforward and inexpensive speed light and then modify it and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So a lot of people like to use tripods for food photography and that's slightly so they can use slower shutter speeds and make the most of natural light but also so everything is just still and consistent and enables you to focus on your composition. Now you'll notice we're actually using what we would call an overhead rig. There are many tripods and if you're thinking of investing in one it's really important to get a tripod that will allow you to do overhead shots and we've put an example on the slide to show you the kind of thing that we mean. They're great but we still found that we couldn't necessarily get the tripods or the, or the cameras and the lenses high enough for the really good overhead shots and overhead shots are one of the most important elements of food photography and filming. So basically Brent built us one. So basically you just need two lighting stands and they don't have to be heavy duty and then you have to create some kind of bar. So in terms of the actual overhead bar we do two things. One is we attach a camera pointing straight down and then we also put a secondary screen up and that secondary screen is really just there to help me with composition and framing. With these Sony cameras though, there's also software that, that you can use to tether and use a laptop and that can be also super useful, particularly if you're doing this commercially and clients want to see what you're doing. And finally, in terms of modifiers, again, there's loads on the market and a lot of people ask questions. Really, you need to be able to do two things. One is, is uh, diffuse and that means you're putting an, uh, an element between the light source and the food and you can go and buy very specific ones, but to be honest, you can go to Ikea and get a shower curtain, which will do exactly the same thing. If you do invest in soft boxes, they will come diffused and often have a secondary in a baffle, which adds additional elements of diffusion. And then you've got reflectors. And it's often a good idea to invest in a reflector. When I say a reflector, you can get reflectors which actually have a number of different surfaces from whites to metallics to even black which will absorb light rather than reflect it. You can also cut out pieces of cardboard and we do this all the time so don't go rushing out to spend money when you can try a real DIY approach. So in terms of camera placement we've touched on the overhead which is probably one of the most critical views in food photography and as I said enabling you to do that easily really helps. And then I would say anywhere between a 25 degree and a 75 degree angle is great for food. 25 degrees when you're very low to the, the counter surface, tending to be used for food with height, burgers, stacks of waffles, that kind of thing. Whereas as you're moving a bit higher, it suits most food. And really you're trying to get a combination of angles to tell the story both in filming and also in photography and you'll see on food blogs that the same basic setup can be shot from a number of different angles and the best thing to do is just shoot a lot of angles and then see which works best for the actual food in question. Often with overhead shots you can also crop in afterwards. We do this with filming as well so we film in 4k to make sure that when we crop the video in post-production we've still got great quality. So aperture is a really important part of food photography and filming but most people tend to think of using a wide open aperture to focus on a specific area of food and here we've got a slide to show you and you can see this on the image of these small tarts that by using a 135 combined with a super wide open aperture you can focus in on a very small area and it looks fantastic. So coming back to overhead shots which are really important, aperture has a really important role to play here and I think often people slightly misunderstand it. So 
We've put some slides in to help explain what we mean. So it's very important to ensure that everything in the frame is in focus. Now that may sound obvious, but when you're using bowls and maybe glassware and things of different height, it can actually be more difficult than you think. So this slide shows a number of screenshots taken from a depth of field calculator. The thing to realise is that the focal length remains the same, which is an 85mm lens, and the distance of the lens to the subject also remains the same. The only thing that changes is the f-stop or aperture, and you can see we run on the left from 1.8 through to f8 through all the way to f16. At the bottom there, there's information showing you what's in and what's out of focus, and that's the thing you need to see, that actually at f1.8 there is less than a centimeter in focus and you need to make that call have a look at what's in your frame the type of food that you're actually photographing and then even potentially use a depth of field calculator to make sure that everything in the frame is in focus and you can see now if i just lift this up towards the lens that very quickly we become to be at focus and you can see right there that this is out of focus and the bowl is in focus. Now we always use manual focus for overhead food photography because you don't want, as you're moving things around the frame, the autofocus system to be jumping. So we've touched on aperture and the other thing we get asked a lot about is actually the role of shutter speed in food photography and it's a different role to filming. In food photography we use shutter speed to either slow down and blur motion or to do the opposite to actually freeze motion so if you're thinking about pouring you may want to freeze motion but if you're thinking about shaking maybe flour or that kind of thing you may want a creative blur effect or you may not and shutter speed is the thing that's going to do this for you so on this slide you can see we've taken exactly the same setup and we've used three very different shutter speeds now, the thing that has to change in order to keep the exposure the same is therefore ISO. And you can see on the first shot, to get that blurred, very creative look, we're at 20th of a second at f2.8, and we're at 640 ISO. Moving on to the middle slide, we've um, got a little bit faster to an 80th of a second, still at f2.8, and that has meant we've had to move at ISO up to 2500, which is high. And too high for commercial photography. Moving over to the right hand side, you'll see that only at 3 20th of a second, still at f2.8, in order to get the same kind of exposure, we're now at ISO 6400, and that is just not acceptable because you're going to get noise. And this is where we believe the role of artificial lighting comes in and using things such as flash. So you can see here that We've taken that final image which was shot at ISO 6400 and rather than using natural light we're now using flash and a speed light and that's shot at 800th of a second in high speed sync again at f2.8 and now our ISO is back down to 160th so a really high quality image that's also capturing and freezing movement so you can see there there is a role for investing in some kind of strobe or speed light if you're wanting to do creative effects like this. So we're going to briefly talk about lighting. It's a massive subject and to be honest, we'd be better off heading over to the Planet E masterclass if you really want to dig into it. But fundamentally, there's two types of lighting that are very different and a very different approach. And one is what we call soft and directional. Now, with people photography, Generally, you want lights to be in front of the person, and that's what we've done here for the filming. So there's relatively soft light thrown onto somebody. There's not shadows. Um, it's quite flattering. That's not flattering for food. Food, has, you need a very, very different approach, and we tend to think about lighting from either the side of food all the way around to being directly behind food. And... That is a big change if you've been photographing people and are now thinking about photographing food. On the slide we show 
the, a setup here and this was actually for some filming that we did but you can see we're using one of the B10s a massive umbrella which gives super soft light and then you can see on the other side to the right hand side of the food there's a, a piece of board which is acting as a reflector to just lift shadows even more so the bigger the light source the better if you are using something small like a speed light you're going to need to diffuse that with some big piece of material or perhaps bouncing it at a wall or something so you're wanting to create almost like an enormous window now potentially something that i find a bit more interesting is really shaping light and creating something a bit more dramatic so here's a slide showing a still life painting from the 15th century and on the right hand side you can just see a shot of some peaches now it looks very simple but actually trying to create this with food photography involves something called a gobo which is a go between and we're going to show you our little homemade one so we, we went off to home base and we bought some of these very thin foam boards and we created a, basically a house because you don't want any light coming in from the side or the top that's really critical and at the back we would have a board so a backdrop something dark and then what we actually did you can see here is we cut a rectangle out and then on the top here we replace these and we create different gobos and depending on the effect if you want a spotlight you might do something with a circle because we wanted a, a slit of light we actually had to um, cut out a triangle again if that doesn't make sense to you we go into this in a lot of detail in the planet eat masterclass so i really recommend you go and have a little look at that because we also talk about the type of lighting you need to get this effect which is not using diffusers, it's a very different approach. So we're going to end by discussing styling. And there are many different elements, and one of that is specifically food styling. Now, when you get into commercial food photography and videography, you'll find there will be a specialist food stylist on set whose job is to just make the food look great. So that is different to the prop styling, the food styling. On the Masterclass series for Planet Eat, I actually chat to a food stylist and she discusses her role in that. So if you're interested and want some hints and tips, I'd go and have a watch. Now, most people who are food bloggers or are wanting to do food photography for Instagram and social media want to be able to do it all themselves. And it's a lot to do the... Um, the lighting and the photography as well as the styling but it's absolutely possible so in terms of prop styling it is I think quite personal and it's a good idea to try and collect a range of colors and styles but you'll know what you like we use charity shops and flea markets and eBay to collect bits and bobs and you will find you'll probably get quite a random selection but often for food photography you only need one plate for a certain setup now there are certain things that work and certain things that don't and the biggest or the bane of food photography and videography is reflections now reflections is just physics and again I try and dig into it a bit more in the masterclass for Planet 8 so I really suggest if you struggle with that a bit go and have a watch however you can help yourself by buying props that reduce reflections so here I've got a few examples um, in, uh, in front of me and you'll see that these plates are incredible they're totally matte so there's a very, very soft sheen, and you can see in here, but that's actually a nice amount rather than a real hot spot. And again, this plate here is very similar. It's got a, a matte effect. They're quite hard to find, so when we do find them, we often buy one or two. Also plates like this, which have got a little bit of interesting texture. The texture is fantastic. Linens. There are many kind of stylists and everything and prop shops now where you can buy things, so we tend to buy bits and bobs as we go. Cutlery is a big thing, obviously, and again, this tends to start the whole issue of reflections, and we much prefer cutlery that has the aged patinaed look because it's much easier to work with. However, we do have a little secret and this helps and we have this anti-reflect spray which you can spray on and it will reduce reflections. You don't want to be eating the food afterwards though, so just be careful and make sure that you clean it off. And then finally backgrounds, you'll obviously see that we've had a couple down on, the, on, on our kitchen surface. 
There are a number of companies out there that make them. One of my favourites is actually photo boards. They're really good price, really good range. They're wipe clean, which is fantastic. So if you spill any food or any liquid, you can it, it clean them off. And we've got a range from light to dark. So it's often useful to actually buy two boards that are exactly the same. And you can see an example of this here, the very dark wood boards. And the reason we do that is because you want to be able to have uh, the, the, if you like, the, the surface for the food shot, but also a, a backdrop. So we will put one behind and we often just fix it with clamps and another stand. And this is important when you're actually doing shots which are at an angle. So going back to the 25 to 75 degree shots, what's in the background is part of the frame and it can be a real problem to get rid of your own kitchen or wherever you're working so it's really helpful to be able to do this and and create almost like a little infinity backdrop so most of what we've been discussing is equally relevant to filming as to photography the styling the lighting the camera angles all of that remains exactly the same apertures even the only time it differs is with your shutter speed and your settings now we will obviously put out a final video at 25 frames uh, which is totally standard in the UK and we will always film at 50 frames per second so that we can halve it if you like and create some slow-mo a change of pace in filming food in food filming is so important because we use slow-mo a lot but we also may may speed up footage as well, particularly if it's something which you want to get a sense of what's happening but you don't want to do the stirring for 30 seconds of, of a video. So that's where it becomes very important. The other important, I think, thing to note is the storytelling aspect of video. With stills you're literally taking a shot and a standalone shot and then you may group a number of shots for a blog post or a social media post and that's great but with filming you have to have a continuous start to finish from ingredients if you like through to finish dish and we have learned to use interesting transitions to just help the, the, the progress and we love the overhead camera for that because and we're going to show you an example shortly we tend to lift things towards the camera and drop again to just transition from say ingredients to putting something in the oven to a, f a final dish so we're going to show you a short clip and I want you to just watch it thinking about lighting thinking about camera angles thinking about styling and thinking about transitions so there's definitely more planning with food filming than photography but it's actually more rewarding and and in many ways more creative so if you're already shooting stills why not give video a go? There's obviously an element of post-production and if you want to know more about that then I suggest you get in touch with Brent because he's the filming guru and we do a lot of video training in both the actual filming and technique side of things but also post-production through our training school which is Training by Lumiere.